So I will first talk about so some fundamental properties of uh, oriospatial cells in the hippocampus. So oriospatial cells, uh, that's a term, it's not a standard term, oriospatial cells. That's a term that my PhD students have coined. Um, it contains the oreo for orientation and spatial for spatial location because you find cells in the hippocampal formation that some of which uh, are tuned to the heading direction of the red and some are tuned to the location of the red. So the first type of cell I want to talk about are the angular head velocity cells. Now, um, so for the purpose of this uh, tutorial, it's sufficient to think of uh, the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus as sort of structures that talk to each other, and then there's the rest of the brain. Yeah? Um, angular head velocity cells are found outside of this uh, entorhinal cortex hippocampus uh, formation, and they respond to the as the name says, as the, to the angular head velocity. So if you plot the firing rate um, as a function of the angular head velocity, uh, there are different types of cells. Some are sort of fire like this, right? So depending on the head velocity, angular velocity, the firing increases, for example, if the head turns more to the left. Another type of cell might have the opposite tuning, like this one. But there are also cells that um, have more such a, such a tuning, for instance. Right? So there are all kinds of different tunings, but the key point is that the firing rate depends on the angular velocity and not on the head direction or any other property. So these are the angular head velocity cells. So they need uh, um, input from the vestibular system and they project to the next type of cells the head direction cells. So these cells are tuned to the heading direction of the red and ideally do not depend on anything else. So here we have phi as a heading direction and the firing frequency typically is sort of low if um, for most of the directions, and then it goes up, and then down again for uh, uh, sort of so so that this cell is tuned to this particular orientation. So these cells are also out, out, also found outside of the hippocampus, and they receive input from the angular head velocity cells, and they don't fire if you deactivate uh, the vestibular system, which would make sense, right? Um, if you look at, if you s simulate, um, if you record simultaneously from a number of such cells, you find um, that they rotate coherently. And by that I mean if you have a second cell, let's say that's tuned like this, yeah? and now you put, in an, uh, the, the, you, you, you put the red in an environment, so the, the experiment goes like this. You have a circular path along which the red runs, right? So there are some textures on this path, and there are also some landmarks uh, in the periphery. And now what you can do is you can rotate. So you measure these head direction cells in this setup, and you measure a certain tuning compared to the north direction. And then you rotate the proximal cues, so the, the, the textures on the path in one direction, and you rotate the distal cues in the other direction. And then 
Well, you might think that some of the heterodirection cells, they link to, uh, they follow the proximal cues and others the distal cues, but that's not what happens. So the whole tuning changes coherently to one or the other side. So if the two tuning curves have a distance of 20 degrees, this distance is maintained uh, no matter what kind of manipulations you do here to the system. The cells tend to follow the distal cues, so that's what they usually do. So the distal cues are more important than the proximal cues, so the far away cues are more important than the nearby cues, and that's sort of reasonable because Distant cues are more reliable in telling us uh, the direction. So if you have a mountain some, somewhere far away, that's more reliable in telling us the direction than, I don't know, a little box on the side. Because if I move myself, uh, the direction in which the box is uh, might vary, but the mountain stays pretty much the same unless I move large distances. The next type of cells I want to talk about are the grid cells. If a rat runs in a large environment, follows a path there, it fires at some locations. So if you record from a grid cell, as the rat runs in this environment, so this is, if I don't know, 2 by 2 meters or 4 by 4 meters or so, um, then at some locations the red will fire, the, sorry, the, the cells will fire, um, and at others it will not fire, and then it will start fire again, etc. Um, and interestingly, if you record this for some time, the locations at which this grid cell fires forms a, a grid-like structure. So you have such a and it's a fairly regular grid. Uh, so yeah, some maybe looks like this. So the cell would fire, for instance, here, and then as the red runs through here, would fire here, then as the red runs through here, etc. Um, and interestingly, this is a, re um, a regular hexagonal grid. So you see um, this forms triangles. And another triangle, and another triangle, and this also starts to be a triangle. So here you see the hexagonal pattern, right? So this here, that's why it's often called hexagonal pattern. Let's go around. Going here. These kind of types of cells. Um, are in the enteroidal cortex, in the medial part, so in, in sort of one half of the enteroidal cortex. The spacing between the place fields of this grid cell are independent of the size of the environment. So if you take a larger environment, This would just continue with the same spacing. And so on. However, if you have a, uh, if the red is in a familiar environment and you squeeze the environment, then actually um, the pattern gets squeezed. So in an unfamiliar environment, the grid starts with a sort of fixed uh, spacing, but if you then change the size, the, grids, the grid also gets squeezed together, but not proportionally. So if you, if you squeeze this by a factor of uh, one half or so, the um, grids actually move together a little bit less. So it's a bit complicated interaction between the grids and the environment. So this is, would be one grid cell, and that's important. So these different firing fields here um, are the locations at which a single grid cell would uh, fire. 
So this is a structure in the environment of a single grid cell recorded in entorhinal cortex. If you consider other grid cells, so let me indicate the grid now just with little crosses. So we have this grid-like of structure. If you record from a cell that is nearby, what you find is that it has also a grid structure. And that has the same spacing as the first grid cell, but shifted slightly in phase. But it has the same orientation. You see the little uh, pink uh, center is always a little bit um, to the left, upper left of the blue ones. And that's con consistent. So you could move one cell, um, so the grids of one cell a little bit, and then align it with the blue one. That happens if you have, if you record from nearby cells. So the cells form groups or modules um, with identical spacing but slightly phase shifted relative to each other. If you record from grid cells that are farther away from this blue one, you actually find different spacings. And the interesting thing is if you look at the spacing, so you, re, you record sort of one, at one end of the entorhinal cortex, and you, you look at the spacing, which might be, I don't know, 60 centimeters or so, right? And then you go a little bit further, then sort of the, the spacing increases along the, 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 the entorhinal cortex, so this is one thing, but they also form groups, right? So there seem to be um, discrete steps in which the spacing increases. And the factor between the spacing is roughly one point, uh, they're different, so 1.4 to 1.7 maybe, depending on whom you ask. If the red goes into a different environment, the same place fields place cells will be active, and they will have the same spacing and the same alignment. So it's a really a coherent representation of space that can be used in any environment. These cells are established right away instantaneously. So if you put the red in a new environment, they're, as far as one can tell, uh, they are there right from the start. So if you put the red in here and it, runs to start, uh, it, it starts running, then it fires right away at the location where you would later identify a place field because you need, of course, a lot of data to establish this grid spacing. So in the very beginning, you don't have this, but then in, in hindsight, sort of you can tell, okay, when I put the red in, it started firing right away. The grid representation is established instantaneously, so it is established without sort of reference to familiar visual cues or something, but once the red has familiarized itself with the environment, it actually follows visual cues, so if you turn the visual cues around, the whole grid representation will turn along. But it does not really, so that indicates a uh, sort of a, um, some input from the, visual, um, from the visual system, but if you turn off the light, uh, the grid cell representation maintain, is maintained, so it, it's preserved even in darkness. So it uses visual input, but it does not really strictly depend on it. And the idea here is that the grid cell representation is uh, can sort of is based on path integration. So the red knows how it works and can establish this grid cell representation based on that. But path integration generally has a drift. So if you close your eyes, you're walking around. For a few meters, you still know where you are, but then you get more and more uncertain. So that's the drift in path integration. So occasionally, you would like to open your eyes and reassure you where you are, and then use visual input to realign the whole thing. And maybe one can think of this 
the grid cell representation in that way that you can do it right away, but it helps to get visual input to keep it um, coherent. The next type of cells I want to talk about are the place cells. They're actually conceptually much simpler than the grid cells in that they have only one place field. So again, a top view of an environment as the red runs around, the cell would fire within that location regardless of the orientation of the red um, and nowhere else. Place cells sometimes have several place fields, but sort of the typical case would be to have one place field. If you record from a different cell, you might have a place field here, and a third place cell might have a place field somewhere else. Now, if you put the red in a new environment, the activities of the place cells vary, changes. So um, some cells might not fire, fire anymore. Uh, but I assume that all three cells fi still fire, but you will get a, a sort of a, what's called a global remapping. So the cells are at completely different locations, and all their also their relative position has changed. So here you see yellow and uh, pink are close to each other, while here yellow and blue are close to each other. So that is called global remapping, and that happens if you really have large changes in the environment, in particular if you put the enclosure in a different um, office or, or, or lab, um, so where the, all the landmarks around would be different. If you just change smaller things, and that means in this case more proximal things, so things that are closer, so you, for example you change the, uh, uh, some, some landmarks here, then you get something that's called rate remapping. So in that case the uh, place cells would still be at the same positions. Um, but uh, the, the response activity might change, right? might be much weaker, and other cells might be stronger. So rate remapping if you have sort of small changes in the environment, and global remapping if you have large changes in the environment. Um, you also have, I mean, there have also been uh, experiments where you first train the red now drawn much smaller scale in a circular environment and in a square environment. And once the place fields have been established there, sort of you, 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 you gradually um, go over to, uh, sort of, uh, to more. So you morph the shape from square to circle. And as you gradually change the shape, the responses of the place fields also change. And there are different versions of that. So sometimes uh, the place fields are active at the similar level up to a certain point, and then abruptly they just stop firing, or, uh, or they're, they're sort of there's a gradual uh, change of firing rate. So there are different versions, but it's generally good to know about these morph experiments. I forgot to mention that these cells are in the hippocampus. Uh, the grid cells were in the entorhinal cortex, and the head direction had uh, um, angular head velocity cells were outside of the of these two structures. If you consider place fields in an open environment like this one, a 2D environment, they will be sort of orientation invariant. So no matter whether the red runs this direction or this direction, it will f uh, fire in both cases. However, if you consider a linear track, and a lot of these experiments um, have been done on a linear track because you gather sort of it's easier to gather a significant amount of data. And what you find here is because the red is just moving left and right, uh, you find place fields sort of for one direction and another set of place fields for the other other direction, right? So you find uh, directional, directional place fields. So these yellow ones would be active as the red runs to, to the right, and these ones would be active as the red runs to the left. Now if you look closely 
carefully at the firing pattern that you get from these place cells and you look at sort of three successive place fields like this. You find a phenomenon that's called phase precession and that is relative to, to an oscillation that's sort of ongoing with about 8 hertz or so. That's called theta oscillation. And if you plot the spikes of the place cells relative to the theta oscillation, so that's sort of a global oscillation in the whole network, you see the following phenomenon. So as the red enters this place field, uh, let's say the pink cell uh, fires here, and then it fires here, and then it fires here. Uh, and what you see that relative to the theta phase, it comes in the, at the beginning where the red enters the um, place field, the spike comes relatively late in that, in that sort of trough here, and then uh, the second spike comes earlier and the third spike comes even earlier. So that's the phase precession um, phenomenon. And if then the red enters the blue one, sort of let's say one cycle later, the blue one starts at the very end of this trough, and then also it, it sort of starts moving forward, and the yellow one maybe starts here, and then well, I can't. So you get it right here. Um, so what you see is sort of as the red goes through the place fields, uh, the place fields gradually start to, uh, so one by one, start to fire. And because of this phase precession effect, or it's a little bit of a question sort of what comes first, but along with this phase precession effect, you also see that the spikes within one theta cycle, these three spikes, reflect the order of the place fields through which the red runs. So you get pink, blue, and yellow also on this short time scale. So notice here that we have two different time scales. The one is a behaviorally relevant time scale, and that is this one here. So the, it first enters this uh, the uh, red place field, then the blue place field, then the yellow one. So that would be that, that time scale. And within a theta cycle, you get the same order again uh, replayed or, or, or reproduced. But replay is a good uh, uh, keyword here because if the red stops, then the theta uh, oscillation stops. Uh, but you still get these um, sort of this fast, as it calls, replay of the place cells in the order in which they have been encountered um, in sort of in the real behavioral situation or reverse. So you have forward uh, replay and you have backward replay. And this is not drawn to scale, so this is roughly 20 times faster than. Uh, also, this replay is 20, roughly 20 times faster than the real behavioral time scale. So there's really a compression of these sequences. And it's interesting to speculate what that uh, might be good for. The last type of cells I want to talk about are so-called few cells. And there are actually two variants I want to talk about. So the one would correspond to place cells and the other one to grid cells. Um, so these are cells that have been found in monkeys. So far I've t talked about uh, oriospatial cells in rats, so now it's about monkeys. And there you find cells that respond to fixation points. So let's assume sort of this is a, a drawing of, the, of one wall of the, of the room and you see the walls on the right and on the left side. Um, no, let me let me rather draw. Okay, so this would be sort of a top view, and this would be a front view, and then you find cells that respond as a monkey looks at a particular location on the wall, and that's not because there is a particular picture there or something. It's just it seems to be just the location, uh, and another cell then um, uh, fires to that location, etc. So now, if we take the top view of this. Uh, of this room, right? So this this wall now would be this line here from the top. So there would be uh, um, sort of a response as the monkey looks at this location. And the interesting thing is that uh, this is true. So no matter, so if the monkey, for example, is here and looks here, or the monkey is here and looks there. So now 
In both cases, his cell would fire. And in the two cases, the monkey is at a different location as well as it has a different head direction. So it is neither a head direction cell nor a place cell. It really seems to uh, respond to that particular location at the wall. Now you might wonder why do the monkeys have these view cells and rats have uh, place cells. Well, that might have to do with the fact that uh, monkeys actually fixate, right? So, so like humans, while rats rather scan the whole environment. So for monkeys, maybe the position where they look is more uh, sort of is a more central thing um, than than for a rat. There's a similar thing uh, in the entorhinal cortex. So these kinds of cells are again in the hippocampus, and but they have also been found cells, um, how do I draw this? Uh, this is again uh, the view sort of of the, of the wall, um, facing wall, cells that behave like grid cells. And these cells have been found in the entorhinal cortex. So you would have cells that, that have this grid-like structure, right, in the visual field. So this idea of grid cells and place cells is something that possibly in monkeys generalizes um, also to the visual system, so gaze position rather than the position of the rat in an environment. Okay, maybe to, to remind you, we had sort of the enteral cortex, the hippocampus, we had uh, head direction cells here, or um, um, angular, angular head velocity cells, velocity cells outside of the system, we have the head direction cells, here, we have the grid cells here, and we have the place cells here. Okay, so that uh, uh, concludes my overview of uh, aureospatial cells, in mainly in rodents and partly also in monkeys.